Hey, how's it going? I'm your host, Gerhard Lezu, and you're listening to Ship It, a podcast about getting your best ideas into the world and seeing what happens. We talk about code, ops, infrastructure, and the people that make it happen. Yes, we focus on the people because everything else is an implementation detail. What is observability? I don't mean metrics, logs, and traces. I mean learning from production. I mean being curious, observing the software that you build in ways that no one thought before, and then sharing those observations with your team. Today, I talk with charity majors, ops engineer, an accidental startup founder at Honeycomb IO, and by that she means CTO. Some of you know her as Mipsy Tipsy or charity.wtf, her website. We talked about high performing teams, why 15 minutes or bust, and how she recommends that we start with Honeycomb for our own monolithic Phoenix app that runs changelog.com. There is just one step, and I didn't even know how simple it is. Can you guess what I'll be doing this weekend? Oh, and we even talk how Honeycomb uses Honeycomb to learn about Honeycomb, which in my mind is one of the top traits of any service that is worth trying out. Before I forget, you can download an early release of the upcoming Observability Engineering book for free. You have to share your email address, I did, but then you get longer answers to some of the topics that we discussed today. I'm thinking, listen to this episode, and if you hear something interesting, download the book preview and see if you can find out more in the book. Big thanks to our partners Fastly, LaunchDarkly and Linode. Our bandwidth is provided by Fastly, learn more at fastly.com, feature flags powered by launchdarkly.com, and we love Linode. They keep it fast and simple. Check them out at linode.com forward slash changelog. What's up, shippers? This episode is brought to you by our friends at Fly. Fly lets you deploy your apps and databases close to your users in minutes. You can run your Ruby, Go, Node, Dino, Python, or Elixir app and databases all over the world. No ops required. Fly's vision is that all apps should run close to their users. They have generous free tiers for most services, so you can easily prove to yourself and your team that the Fly platform has everything you need to run your app globally. Learn more at fly.io slash changelog and check out the speed run in their excellent docs. Again, fly.io slash changelog or check the show notes for links. We are going to ship in three, two, one. So in 2020, 16th of June, I reached out, I sent you a direct message, and it read like this. Hi, I can't make headspace for our conversation at the moment, will ping when I'm done with current work in progress and have loaded necessary context to make it worthwhile. Liking your recent tweets, by the way, looking forward to where you're taking the mindshare. And I was referring to the observability mindshare. This was 2020. 17 months later, I think that mindshare is gaining even more traction if that was possible. Uh, I think it was expected, but uh, I really liked where the whole observability landscape has shifted and you, Charity, and your team made a massive contribution to that. Yeah, that's very sweet of you. You gave lots of great talks, lots of great presentations, and I think this will be another one, I think. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. That's my hope. Cool. That's my intention. <laughs> so I know that you get asked this question a lot, but I think it's important that we start here. What is observability? Well, it comes from the mechanical engineering and control systems theory. Uh, the definition of observability, it's the mathematical dual of controllability. And it means how much can you understand about any internal system state just by looking at it from the outside? Hmm. So if we extrapolate that to computers, I think a lot of interesting things flow from it. You know, and it's, it's increasingly relevant. You know, it used to be that we had the load balancer, the app and the database. And you could pretty much predict most of the ways the system was going to fail. It repeated itself over and over. Nowadays, you know, people have got microservices, they might have hundreds of services, you know, all these different storage systems. And the systems tend to fail in a way that is different every time. 
And so observability is about instrumenting your code in such a way that you could ask any question, understand any internal system state with no prior knowledge, with no existing, without ever having seen it before. Can you understand what's happening on your very complex system? So instrumenting your code, that is a really important one. Mm -hmm. Would you say that you'd need to instrument your code every time you'd need to observe an aspect of it? Kind of the, the point of it is that you shouldn't have to add new code to observe it. Like that's part of the point. If you've gathered enough context, you know, you should be able to slice and dice and ask new questions without shipping custom code to have to. Because adding custom code implies that you knew in advance what you needed to look for, right? So the code, in a way, it needs to expose some information about how it runs. You want to gather any information you happen to know about, you know, the parameters that were passed in or the runtime environment, the language internals, the container, the systems environment, as well as, you know, you, you want to wrap automatically and, and store like any HTTP calls. You want to store like the amount of time it took, what the contents were, et cetera. Any database calls, you want to store the, the raw query, the normalized query, the amount of time it took, you know, the return value. You know, you, you want to store anything that might help you find this request at some later date. Any user ID, any shopping cart ID, like high cardinality, you know, dimensions like IDs are, are incredibly identifying and incredibly useful. So the point is, you don't know what's going to be useful in the future. So you should just throw in anything you think might be useful and someday it will be. I find it really interesting how you keep mentioning things which make business sense. They are typically related to the problem that your application or your code is trying to solve. What you're not saying is CPU, memory, disk. That's very interesting. Why is that? I feel like... We're seeing a bit of a divergence. You know, I think that monitoring tools, things that are metrics-based, are the right tool for the job when it comes to understanding your infrastructure. You know, from the perspective of the service, is this service healthy, right? But that's a very different question from, is my code working? Is this user happy? Is Can the request execute from end to end, right? That's the observability tool. Now, I do think that, you know, the observability from the perspective of your code I think there are a couple of metrics that, that are probably useful to software engineers. You do want to know if you just shipped a change and your memory usage tripled. You do want to know if you just shipped a change and your CPU is suddenly saturated. But there's only like three or four of those that are really useful most of the time. The rest of those metrics tend to be everything under slash proc or all of the like IPv6, you know, counters and statistics and stuff. And, and that should not be in the purview of software engineers who are trying to write code and understand it in production. So the way I hear it, it's more about almost like the user, the end user experience, what makes them happy, what makes them sad. It's a radical perspective shift from the perspective of the service to the perspective of the user. Another way to think of this is, well, we blew up the monolith. It used to be you had a monolith and if all else failed, you could attach GDB and you could just step through it, right? Hmm. Well, then we blew up the monolith and suddenly the request is hopping the network all over the place. Now you can't step through it. And so, you know, part of the way that we focus on instrumenting is gathering up all of that information around the perspective of the request so that we're almost like passing it along with the request as it hops the network from step to step. So that to me sounds a lot like what the microservice architecture would advocate for, right? You have lots of microservices. You're you have like screwed if you don't have something like this and you're running microservices, yeah. Right, so this is very important for microservices. What about serverless? Absolutely. In fact, I will often tell people that the way that, the right way to think about instrumenting your code in the future is just imagine you're, you're running serverless, right? Because you might not have access to all of the underlying infrastructure. All you have access to is what can you tell through the lens of the instrumentation that you're embedding in your code? Turns out you can tell a lot and that's what's actually important. Interesting. So if you do have a monolith, what do you do? Can you still use the observability that you mentioned about? Absolutely. It's never not easier to have observability tools. I feel like though, when you're asking someone to radically change the way that they do things or adopt a new tool, what you're offering them needs to be an order of magnitude better than what they've got. Mm -hmm. For some monoliths, 
It is. For some, it's not. For a lot of monoliths, they can get along just fine with, you know, some data dog graphs, some dashboards, some, you know, monitoring checks, because almost all the complexity is bound up inside the application logic. And, you know, they're familiar with that. So, you know, you should never embrace, you know, change for the sake of change or complexity for the sake of complexity. If what you have is working for you, more power to you. The problem is that, like, for so many of us, it's almost like falling off a cliff. Like it's very discontinuous. When when the old solutions stop working for you, they really stop working. And it's it's pretty pretty abrupt and pretty brutal. Right, that makes sense. Going back a little bit to the users, I think that is very important because all of a sudden being able to see or like visualize in a way the journey yeah. that a user takes through your app and what it entails through your app, I think that is very powerful. Yeah. And being able to understand what is not working for that user specifically yes. is important, but also extrapolating that to all your users. Yes. If it's broken for this user, who else is it broken for? Mm. Absolutely. And I like that perspective because that can work equally well for development teams. So we often think that our end users are the only ones that benefit from the code. But a lot of the time, the development teams spend a lot more time with the code, oh, wrestling it, fixing it, yes. debugging it, whatever needs to happen. So how does the observability that you think about help those types of users? Well, the best engineers I've ever worked with are the ones who will have you know, one window up with their IDE and another window up with their observability tool. And they're just constantly, they're entering into a conversation with their code as it's live in production. So observability isn't like a magical, you know, fairy solution in and of itself, right? There are other important components here that work kind of in synchrony. And I think that CICD, having a really healthy CICD pipeline is another really important part of this because when you're writing code, you have all that context in your brain. It's fresh. You know what you're trying to do. You know what trade-offs you made. You know what you didn't try, or what you tried and what failed, you know? And that stays in your brain for and it's ours, not how much longer after you've switched context and picked up a different project, right? Mm -hmm. Then it's gone and it's never coming back, right? Mm -hmm. And so like having a CICD pipeline where once you merge your changes to main, it automatically, you know, picks it up, runs tests and deploys within, I think 15 minutes is, is a good upper bound. And very importantly, deploys only your changes, right? If it's small, it's, it's compact, you know, it's a few minutes, then you can ship one engineer's changes at a time, which gives you a really powerful sense of ownership. When you know your changes are going live within 15 minutes, you're highly incentivized to go look at it through the lens of the instrumentation you just wrote. When you're merging your changes and you're pretty sure that at some point in the next 12 to 72 hours, your changes and anywhere from zero to... 15 other people's changes are going to be shipped. Nobody's going to go look at it. <laughs> like, nobody's going to go look at it, right? So you've severed that, that tight, virtuous feedback loop of ownership. I also like to point to, you know, Facebook did some great research earlier this year that showed from the moment when you're writing code and you write a bug, the amount of cost and time and pain, et cetera, goes up exponentially when it comes to fixing that bug, the longer it gets, right? Mm -hmm. You've written it, you can backspace, <laughs> that's the easiest it's ever going to be, right? The longer it gets, the more expensive it gets, the more painful it gets, the, the harder it gets. Once it's been, you know, a month or two, it probably won't even be you that's finding and fixing the bug. It'll be some other poor fool who <laughs> has no con context, you know? And so, you know, observability is what allows you to, to like get your microscope out and compare, you know, at, at the level of the raw request. Like, what is different about the request to have this build ID with these changes, with this instrumentation? And once you can see it, it's so easy to fix. Yes. Fixing bugs is, bugs is not hard. Finding the bugs is hard, yes. right? It's always that one character change or the one line change, right? It's And the hardest bugs, that's exactly yeah. what it is. Or you just reorder a line and guess what? Yeah. It starts working again. Nobody knows why. Don't touch it, right? It's that's what typically to, happens. The hard part is finding where in the system is the bug mm -hmm. that you need to fix, right? And, and knowing that there is a bug in the first place. And these are the things that observability is, is so well positioned to do for you. Because it speaks the language of endpoints and variables and... You know, not the language of, you know, low-level system stuff. I think the term observability is overloaded, overused. Well, it is now. When it I is now, right? Not when it started, right? I 
planted my flag on it. That was my <laughs> word. <laughs> You had quite a bit of time to think about it, and I really like the alternatives that you came up with, which I think they all mean observability. One that really stood out to me is being curious in production. Mm. What happens in your production? How do you know what is going on? And obviously production is a metaphor for mm. a system that really matters, okay? Yeah because you maybe work on a software that gets shipped to other users that get to use it in their production. Mm -hmm. And it's not your production, it's their production. So I you're see. removed from it, but still understanding how the software behaves in production, someone else's yeah. is also important. So how can you be curious in production? I mean, what does that even look like? And I think what you've just described captures it well. Reducing that time between introducing the bug and seeing how the system behaves at scale, right? Because that's what production typically means. Lots and lots of requests, lots of weird paths being taken through your code base. Heisenbugs, right? One yeah. in a million. They only happen in production. Right. And I think property testing and fuzzing help with it somewhat, but not to that scale, right? You can't generate production scale. It's impossible. You've just basically got to accept that all the interesting bugs are only going to happen in production. There's no such thing as a staging environment that matches production. It doesn't exist. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And I, I think that's why you should push directly to production. On yeah. a Friday, the day doesn't matter, really. It's just a day. Like, what if it's Saturday? Does it matter? Well, if you're using feature flags, then it shouldn't matter, right? If you're using feature flag, like decoupling deploys from releases is one of the most powerful things you can do for reliability. Mm. I love the phrase that the intercom folks came up with, which is that shipping is the heartbeat of your company. Like if you're a software code, shipping is, it should be as regular, as minor, as uneventful, as boring, as tedious, as pedestrian, as, as a heartbeat, right? Because that's how you deliver value to users. It shouldn't be something that you have to get all worked up about. It should just work. It should happen many, many, many times a day, right? Predictably, et cetera. Any day every day, doesn't really matter, as long as you're shipping. Right, like a lot of people get worked up about the phrase testing and production, but in fact, we all do it. The only question is, do you admit you do it and do you try to build guardrails so that you do it safely or not? Because I agree, testing and production, if you don't have tests, if you don't, whatever, is a terrible idea, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about doing it well, because it's the only way you can test these things. That's right. This episode is brought to you by Armory. With Armory, development teams are empowered to deploy their code with increased safety, resilience, velocity, and compliance to any production target on-prem or in the cloud. In this segment, I'm sharing a clip with Isaac Mascara, CTO and co-founder of Armory. He shares the details about the value they bring to enterprise teams leveraging continuous delivery. If you're using Spinnaker, I've heard of Spinnaker, you're probably aware of some of the operational challenges and some of the gaps in, in functionality. Because when Netflix built it, they built it for Netflix. And so why Armory exists is to help bridge that gap. It's an excellent core technology that helped Netflix deploy at scale in the cloud. But if you want to use it yourself, there are things that need to get done. And in order to deliver those features and deliver that enterprise functionality that our customers need, we build a plugin layer. And in doing so, what that means is you can bring your own Spinnaker, you can use the Armory distribution, and you can get our features and functionality and enterprise scale by layering on those plugins. That is exactly what Autodesk did. They're using the distribution. We are layering on additional plugins that they need, like the Amazon Lambda functionality that we actually built in conjunction with Amazon so that they can actually move faster in the cloud. And that's exactly how we're helping Autodesk. Head to armory.io slash ship it to learn how Armory is helping teams like Autodesk to accelerate their innovation using Armory's enterprise-grade distribution of Spinnaker. Request a demo at armory.io slash ship it. So I think we're both agreeing that shipping into production is very, very important. Anything before that, 
you can do it, sure. Why? Ask yourself. If you have... COVID is in production, it's dead code. Doesn't matter. It doesn't exist. Right. So that's the first one. And the second one is you want that time to be as short as possible. I think anything under 15 minutes is good. But what I'm wondering is why 15 minutes? Totally arbitrary. <laughs> right. Just the longer, the longer it gets, the more pathologies start to creep in. You enter into this sort of death spiral of takes longer, so you eat bigger diffs, so code review takes longer. So, you know, you start to ship multiple changes for multiple people at a time. So you decouple, you know, it just, it's badness. And these numbers I've also pulled out of my ass, but they also seem to be true. If you ship within 15 minutes, that takes you, you know, X number of engineers to build, maintain this code base. If it takes you on the order of an hour or more, you need twice as many engineers. And if it takes you on the order of a day, you need twice as many again. And if it takes you in a week, twice as many again. And I definitely am not exaggerating it. If anything, I am being too conservative and un underestimating it. So, right. and that, that time is not being spent on, it's the worst parts of engineering. It's the waiting on each other and the trying to find the bugs that someone else wrote. And, you know, the engineering can be such a wonderful, beautiful, creative, like, fantastic, you know, profession, but only if you're on a high-performing team that can you know, spend most of its time solving new and interesting hard problems that push the business forward every day. There's nothing magical about it. It's just that I think that, honestly, 15 minutes is achievable for anyone who just invests the engineering effort. It's not rocket science. It's just engineering. You just have to set a level and hold yourself to it. You know, instrument your build pipelines and see where all the time is going to. I think Intercom, again, they're, they're some of my favorite people, but like mm -hmm. they ship in 15 minutes or less and they have a Ruby Rails monolith. <laughs> like if you're using Golang or something, you have no excuse. <laughs> Anyone can get it down to 15 mm -hmm. minutes or so. Five minutes or, or less, that's trickier. Like, I don't think that's achievable for everyone in every stack, but 15 minutes or less, I think that's actually achievable for almost everyone. I think this feels to me very related to testing, right? You don't want your test to take more than some yeah. number of minutes. And if yep. they do, then, well, how many changes can you push to your repository if you have to know, I wait, I don't know, an hour, two hours to know whether you haven't broken anything. I think yeah. this is very similar, but maybe more important because this also includes the tests, right? You would obviously would want your test to run within these 15 minutes and then, you know, have your code deployed. So yep. I think I think there is some sense there, but also I think even shipping may be an overloaded term. Like what does it mean to ship? Well, obviously getting code out there in production, but what if you think about shipping as learning. How long would you want to wait to learn something or actually to get an answer to one of your questions that you have? Mm -hmm. I wonder, what if and you try something and if you have to wait an hour for an answer, yeah. well, I think you'll get frustrated very quickly. If you have to ship a one line change, how long would it take you to get that out, right? For a lot of companies, they haven't prioritized it and it literally takes them hours to do a one line change. And that to me is just, Hmm. unspeakable. The thing is, that even companies who, who take like an hour to change, almost all of them have shortcuts, right? And that's terrible. You really want people to be using, you really want the shortest, fastest, quickest, easiest path to be the default. Like, let's take our example. Changelog.com is a monolithic application. It's a Phoenix-based app. Think of it like Ruby on Rails. It's using a PostgreSQL database. It has Nginx in front, this is Ingress Nginx, it's running on Kubernetes, and there's a load balancer in front, there's a CDN in front as well. So if we wanted to make our setup more observable, the way you think about observability, as we've discussed so far, what should our first three steps be? What language are you using? What language? It's Elixir. Yeah, you should install the Honeycomb Open Telemetry instrumentation. Mm -hmm. into your application. And then that'll give you out of the box. You know, it'll give you, it automatically wraps HTTP and database calls and all this stuff. And then you might want to, at some point, go in and, and add some amount of tracing. 
So the tracing is like the custom stuff, right? Where we care about specific, I know, calls being made, how long they yeah. take, stuff like that. Which is optional, but it's really handy when you're trying to figure out where your time is going or, you know, concurrency problems or stuff like that. Okay. So that was just like one step. Install it and that's it. I like yeah. that. That sounds really good. Okay. That's super simple. Very interesting. And how would we visualize the data? So our app starts emitting those events. What happens next? You go to honeycomb.io mm -hmm. and your landing page will be familiar to you if you used an APM tool before. It'll have like errors and latency and request rate, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But then you can, you can start playing around with it. Like if you're trying to diagnose a problem or if you're... One of my favorite things about Honeycomb that we've done is bubble up, which is this cool thing where if you see a graph and there's a spike or something and you're like, ah, this is bad, or I want to know more about this. You can just mm -hmm. draw a little bubble around that spike. And then we will pre-compute for all the dimensions, like outside and inside of the bubble and diff them, and sort them. And we'll tell you exactly what is different about the thing that you said you cared about, whether that's one thing or five things. So you might go, ah, I care about this. And they'll go, ah, these errors are could be maybe the export endpoint, all from this region of Amazon, all for this particular user ID, all for this particular language pack. And, and it's a really right. nice way to just like immediately see, ah, this is what this is what's different about mm -hmm. the thing that I care about. So let's say that we have certain requests which sometimes are really, really slow. Could Honeycomb help us identify why they're slow? Hell yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll try that. And if it doesn't work, who should I talk to? <laughs> you? Uh, great little intercom bubble pop up in the app that will take mm -hmm. you to our, our support team and they're wonderful. Amazing. Okay. That's exactly what I intend to do next. Excellent. Okay. And behind the scenes, where are all those events going? Well, they come to the Honeycomb API, which is a pretty thin little shim that, you know, does some rate limiting, et cetera, and then drops them into Kafka. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Kafka Q is consumed by a pair of retrievers. That's our custom, you know, I spent my entire career telling people never write a database. And I'd like to be very clear that we have not written a database. We've written a storage engine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> completely okay. Different. What's the difference? <laughs> not much. Right. Uh, okay. <laughs> It's a columnar store, you know, so it gets consumed by a pair of retriever nodes and pretty swiftly it also gets aged out to S3. Mm -hmm. And then when you're issuing requests via the Honeycomb, you know, UI, mm -hmm. the queries are actually run by Lambda jobs, which will then fan out, do a full table scan, sort merge the data and return it to you in the browser. That's interesting. So I hear S3, I hear Lambda. The API, you're not using API Gateway or anything like that from... Amazon? API yeah, Gateway. Whatever the name of the service is, they have a service which basically provides API functionality for your Lambdas. So you can hook up no. Lambdas to API. No, you're not using that. Any any do you know why? I'm curious, genuinely. I, I'm not I'm not sure actually. And then why Kafka? I have to ask that. For other reasons. Since we are writing our own storage engine, it gives us like 18 hours worth of, of backup, you know, if we needed to replace some events or or if anything happened. It's also how we mm. bootstrap, you know, and bring up, you know, new nodes. Why not Kinesis? At the time, I was the one who made that decision. This was like five years ago. And there were some constraints that Kinesis had that weren't, I think it had to do with the, the events and some of the data types that we needed. They just, it wouldn't support, it wasn't flexible enough. Okay, so it's a Kinesis limitation as yeah. was there in the past. And doesn't matter whether it's there now. Obviously you have Kafka, it's running well, I'm assuming. Honestly, ideologically, while I do believe in outsourcing, you know, making making someone else's problem wherever possible, given that Kafka is basically functioning as part of our database, which is, you know, part of very integral to Honeycomb, mm -hmm. it is one thing that I think that it's better for us to have in-house ex expertise and run ourselves. Okay, so that answers my next question, which is if it's a managed service or if it's something that you install, you manage, you update. Yeah, we install and manage update. How is that experience? I'm wondering. Kafka? Some people, yeah, some people say that like managing Kafka, like installing Kafka clusters uh, used to be difficult with Zookeeper. I think that is going away these days. I don't know. You know, not many startups have an ops co-founder. <laughs> okay. And we were fortunate enough to, to have me. So that shit's not that hard if it's your bread and butter. Right. Okay. 
and then it's S3 behind the scenes is Lambda. So I'm assuming that when the Honeycomb UI is displaying those charts from all those events, you're actually consuming those events from S3. Is that right? To draw the... For the first couple of few hours, depends. It's dynamic based on you know, your write throughput, et cetera. But, mm -hmm. but it gets written out to SSDs first. Mm -hmm. And then it gets aged from there into, into S3. So yeah, it's, it's reading from some combination of the local SSDs and S3. It was interesting when we moved from using SSDs for everything to, you know, aging things out to S3, we really thought there would be a severe performance hit. Mm -hmm. Turns out, no. Uh, the performance characteristics are different, but, and speed is incredibly important to us because, you know, we really want people to be in the zone if you just this and this and like at this question and tweak it and tweak it, you know. So like we target, you know, for our 95th percentile, we target one second for those queries. Right. Okay. Quite fast. Yeah. That sounds fast. I mean, we were mentioning 15 minutes before. Now you're telling me one second. So yes, it's, it is very fast <laughs> if you have that reference point. Okay. And I'm assuming that Honeycomb uses Honeycomb to understand Honeycomb. Is that right? Basically. <laughs> we have office dogs. Honeycomb mm. was actually first named Bloodhound. And then we shortened, shortened it to hound.sh. And then we got a cease and desist from Hound CI. So now we're named Honeycomb, but Retriever is the name of our database and Poodle is the name of our front end and, and dog names for everything. We have a dog food cluster that mm -hmm. is how we monitor everything that Honeycomb does with Honeycomb. And then we have a kibble cluster that monitors the dog food cluster. And what monitors the kibble cluster? Nothing. Nothing, <laughs> <laughs> right. You do, right? Are you working or right? Yes, is the answer. Okay. <laughs> right. So... Does the dog food cluster run a different version of Honeycomb? Well, so it's interesting you bring this up. We auto deploy from cron like every 10 minutes. And it first deploys to kibble and then it waits some amount of time. And if everything's okay, then it promotes to dog food and if it waits and then it eventually promotes to production. And all that happens, mm -hmm. happens automatically. So it runs a different version for some amount of time until catch up. So how long does it take for that to make it to production? About an hour pre top. So that means you don't deploy to production first. You go to kibble first, and then dog food, and then production. We consider that production. Right. OK. That's what will become production once everything is OK on kibble. OK. Yeah. And how long do you keep things on kibble before promoting to dog food? It's about an hour. It's about an hour from kibble to dog food, and an hour from dog food to, to production. Did you? find that helping? Did you find it helping having kibble and then dog food before production? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So everybody makes mistakes, even the best ops people in the world. Is that what you're telling me? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I think that makes a lot of sense. I don't oh, yeah. think people, people think like some ops people are like no. demigods. No. Uh, no. no. Everybody makes mistakes, but we fix them so quickly. <laughs> we don't even know. And we don't let them, you know, I think this is like propagate. Mm -hmm. everywhere right we have like all we trust the system and the system it has like all these gates yeah, we never built in computers. <laughs> right or engineers or engineers <laughs> no right why would we do a thing like that <laughs> so i think this brings us to the software development being a socio-technical problem mm -hmm. these people people are fallible they will make mistakes mm -hmm. and a lot of the time it is about those mistakes, which think of them like learning opportunities. Yeah. And if you think of them like that, then you optimize for learning. 15 minutes is important. Mm -hmm. You have those guardrails in place so that things like failures don't cascade. I think that's a better mm -hmm. word for it. So, you know, you have circuit breakers and all those fancy things. Mm -hmm. All it means is like errors don't run havoc in your setup. Yeah. And what else would you say about this? Because I know it's a term which is very dear to you. Yeah, well, I think that people have this image of like, you know, oh, you hire a Google engineer and suddenly your team will get better or something. No, I think that it's pretty clear that any engineer who joins a team will, within, you know, three to six months or so, will be shipping and performing at the level that that team performs, whether that's up or down. Hmm. The power of the group, that the environment that you're in, is far more powerful than your own personal knowledge of data structures and algorithms, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. 
And we have this like weird magical belief in the power of individuals, but we should spend like way more time just paying attention to the environment in which we all write and build and, and ship our code because the way that people are doing it now is the hard way. You shouldn't have to be a great engineer to, to write code and, and get it out quickly. You know, we, we should build systems that that make it easy for engineers to get their code out quickly because I just think we, we have this, we act like great engineers make great teams when it's exactly the opposite. In fact, it is great teams that make great engineers. This episode is brought to you by Armory. And in this segment, I talk with Cole Duclo from Autodesk. Cole is the person responsible for architecting their continuous delivery platform and cloud deployment platform. Cole shares exactly why he chose Armory to ensure the development teams at Autodesk safely deploy code more often while maintaining resilience, velocity, and compliance. My name is Cole Duclo, and I am a senior principal engineer at Autodesk, currently acting as the architect for our cloud deployment platform. So here at Autodesk, we're in the midst of transforming our cloud deployment solutions into more of a platform approach. And it was important for us to leverage a community-driven open source technology like Spinnaker to enable the deployment requirements that our application teams need today. With Spinnaker, it's an open source tool, obviously, and it kind of comes with some risks of the volatility of changes coming in and how do we mitigate that at an enterprise level, which is really important to me as an architect. We chose Armory to, to be a partner in this space to help prevent us and shield us from these highly volatile changes that do get introduced into the community distribution of Spinnaker because they offer their own distribution in Armory specific distribution that's been great for us as an enterprise because of its extensibility with the plugin features that they offer. By adopting this partnership here, we are able to focus on the core capabilities that our application needs, which allows us to then deploy faster and innovate at a higher rate for our customers. And we can offer security and compliance out of the box. And the management of the Spinnaker cluster itself on a day-to-day -day level is is abstracted from us, which is incredible. Head to armory.io slash ship it to learn how Armory is helping teams like Autodesk to accelerate their innovation using Armory's enterprise grade distribution of Spinnaker. Request a demo at armory.io slash ship it. I think we're touching on something very, very important. You keep mentioning systems, you keep mentioning teams. Now, system means teams. It doesn't mean a technical system. It means how everything works. And a system can even mean a company. They're never closed systems, by the way. They're always all sorts of forces. And it changes all the time, sometimes very fast, or some people think like that. Others think it's very slow. But it is a system, all of it. And I'm wondering, what does a high-performing team look like in such a system or a high-performing system? What does it look like from your perspective? High-performing team is one that gets to spend most of their time and energy and focus solving new hard problems that move the business forward, not trudging in the salt mines of engineering, just trying to like find bugs and reproduce bugs and like firefight. And a high-performing team is one that ships often, that doesn't find it remarkable to ship. You know, a high-performing team is one that can take a lot of stuff for granted because there's a real structure, you know, a socio-technical structure around them that the CICD pipeline is well tended to. You know, their, their internal, external SLOs, their, you know, people's time is taken seriously and respected mm -hmm. as the incredibly valuable resource that it is, not frittered away and wasted. So if a team would like to become high-performing, but let's say they're fighting their CICD pipeline, what would you recommend they do? Well, a team or an individual? I mean, I, I feel like you can only really make it decisions as an individual. And while I do believe in like, you know, pitching in and, and, and like trying to make the system better, there are also a lot of places where there are too many entrenched forces that are against <laughs> change. And I, I really think that like people should be more willing to leave their jobs and go 
find a high performing team to join. Go find that high performing team that will make you a great engineer, right? You only get one job. You only have one career. Your career is, it's the most powerful. It's, it's a multi-million dollar appreciating asset that you have an obligation to yourself to, to curate for the long haul, you know? Join great teams that where you don't have to fight to make change, to, to make progress, where you can learn a lot um, from other great people. I've seen too many amazing engineers, you know, stick it out year after year at jobs that didn't appreciate them, where they weren't allowed to make the changes that they knew need, needed to be made. There are other places that will welcome your creativity and will care about your sleep schedule and if you don't feel respected, you probably aren't. Go somewhere else. It is a buyer's market. This is probably the one role that is the easiest to, to find a new, a new job in the entire world. And, and it won't last forever. So take advantage of it. So you make a high-performing team by joining a high-performing team. And then you easiest become... Way. <laughs> that's the easiest way. Okay. And what about the hard way? What about someone that says no? I have decided that I want to make my team high performing and I will stick with them for as long as it takes. Do you have support? Do you have the support of your higher ups? Do you have the support of your team? Because you can't do it on your own, right? Mm -hmm. This is a team effort. So you need to look, you know, and here's where I feel like engineering managers that have, have a lot of, a lot to answer for the state of things today, because engineering managers are the ones who are in the position where they should be able to translate between the business and the engineers. They should be able to not just like take orders about what to spend engineering time on, but like push back, make the case that, you know, just doing product, 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 feature, 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 feature. It's a really short-sighted approach. It's not good for the team. It's not good for the engineers. It's not good for anyone, even though it looks like you're super hella busy, you know, like push back, like make the case. Like learn to translate from, you know, engineering words into like dollars and cents. And, and this is something I don't, I feel like there's a lot of passivity on the part of a lot of engineering leadership when who's going to do it if not you. <laughs> what would you say about product people that, I don't want to use the word boss, but let's say tell engineers what to do. And sometimes the engineers think, you know what, this doesn't feel right. What would you recommend in that situation? I don't think that that's a healthy situation. Product people should never be telling engineers what to do. You know, it should be a triad. You've got product, design, engineering. You're all equals. All your voices matter. You're all experts in your own domain. The idea of a product person telling an engineer what to do in terms of engineering labor is ludicrous. You know, you wouldn't tell them how to run their user surveys. You know, so... Like so much, this comes down to respect and it comes down to a healthy culture. And, you know, you should push back gently, push back more firmly. <laughs> and in the end, if you aren't listened to, leave. What does a healthy product engineering relationship look like? It looks like a triad. It looks like a partnership. Nobody's trying to make anyone do anything. You're all aligned on wanting to move the business forward and wanting to do a good job. And, you know, I'm not saying it's easy, <laughs> but unhealthy power dynamics are should be pretty easy to sniff out. And that's never okay. We've been discussing with Ian Meal in the previous episode about the power of money and especially money flows. And he makes a really good case where he says, you should really follow the money flows because they will dictate mm -hmm. what is important, yeah. what should happen. Yes. How, in your opinion, does the money flow or money come into play when it comes to product and engineering? Because there must be a relationship. What does it look like? What does a healthy relationship look like? Well, this is why, you know, the naive, the simplistic, you know, answer is that we often see is just to focus on feature, feature, features, because there's a straight line from feature to money, or there should be, right? It's a more elliptical line from tech debt to, to money, right? Or from, you know, observability to money or from, you know- Happiness. <laughs> happiness. You know, there, there are a lot of things that are more elliptical, but they're no, no less real, right? It's just a question of short-term investment versus long-term investment. And you can't just play the short-term game all day, all week, all month, all year, or, or or you'll lose people, you'll, you'll lose happiness. You'll, you know, it, it shows just in, in people's weary faces. 
So how would you measure what is important on a team? Money is not it, right? That's a short-term goal, which has many negatives associated with it. It's important, of course, but it shouldn't be the sole driver. No, it depends to some extent. Here's one thing. I think every manager should be, so I do think every engineer who builds a you know 24-7 highly available service should be on call for their work. I also think that you know, getting woken up two or three times a year for your service is reasonable. I think more than that, fear is close to abusive, right? And I think it's engineering manager's job to track this, to make sure that it doesn't get out of hand, to take, you know, assertive, you know, active, you know, measures when it starts to get really noisy, to carve out time for it. Because Sleep, (laughs) sleep is an important thing, which leads to retention of engineers, which leads to, you know, job satisfaction and all other intangibles. But like, that's one pretty solid thing that I can put my finger on. You know, just people's ability to spend their time, you know, focusing and not being interrupt driven, not being woken up, not being firefighting all the time is, you know, every engineering team has two constituents. There's your customers, And there's your engineers. Neither one is more important than the other. That is really powerful. So how do you measure the happiness? Or I think measure is maybe the wrong word. How do you determine how happy and healthy your engineers at Honeycomb are? Well, you know, you can start by asking them and by doing, you know, anonymous surveys now and then. Good engineering managers have their finger on the pulse of their their teams. And, you know, they they should be sensitive to to things. Is a team getting burned out? Is there, are the demands unreasonable? Does the team need, you know, a different composite? Do we need some more senior folks to be doing mentorship? Do we need more challenging, you know, like this is care and feeding of engineering teams should be the job of a good engineering manager. And they should be able to tell you quite a lot right there. You can also look at like top level, you know, metrics like, you know, attrition. But honestly, I'm a big fan of just asking people and building up a trust relationship so that people know they aren't going to be punished for saying something. Would you ask them regularly? Would you let them come to you? What works best? Both. All. All of the above. You know, and also I like asking engineers about each other too. Like, how is so-and-so doing? You know, do they, do you feel like so-and-so is getting stressed or burned out? Because, you know, a, a team of people tends to care deeply for each other. And they're often a lot more sensitive to each other's burnout, et cetera, than they, than they would be for their own. And so, you know, you can ask them about each other too. I really like the way you think about the human element. I really like the way you see us, the engineers, as people at the end of the day. They're not machines, okay? They have to talk to machines, but it doesn't make them one. Engineers are not fungible. You asked about the socio-technical systems and, and like this thought experiment that I use sometimes. Imagine the New York Times. You've got a socio-technical system, right? It's comprised of the people, the tools, the systems, etc. If you took all the people away and replaced them by with equally powerful engineers, equally experienced, etc., and you sent all the New York Times engineers off to the Bahamas, right? How long would it take them to figure out how to fix even a small problem? right? Like so much of the system lives in your head, <laughs> right? Context, with, yes. How do you even log in? Like it would take a really long time. The majority of the system lives in the heads of the people who, who work on it. And so you can't take them for granted. You can't just replace them. Not cogs, not, not cogs, cogs, not machines. They're not pets. They're not cattle. They're people. <laughs> So as a listener, if I had to remember one thing from this conversation, what do you think that should be? If you're frustrated about the performance of your engineering team, take a long, hard look at your CICD pipeline, 15 minutes or bust. And observability, of course, go use the honeycomb free tier. That's a good one. What I would say is be curious in production because that's where all the interesting stuff happens. I would use another word instead of stuff, but you know what I mean. (laughs) Lastly, I would like to talk about a book, which uh, there's an early release, raw and unedited, that you can get for free, Observability Engineering. I think the tagline is even better, Achieving Production Excellence. Mm. I think that's super powerful. So we'll add a link to the show notes. You can go and download it for free, by the way. I think you will need to share your address with a happy and friendly people from Honeycomb. (laughs) But otherwise, I've been reading it 
skimming it, shall I say. I haven't read all of it, but the index looks really good. The way the first question is, what is observability? So we couldn't cover it all, but if you want to really know what observability is, you can go and check it out for free. I, I highly recommend that. Thank you. The book, I know, will be available in its final version. Uh, it's By the way, it's published by O'Reilly. It'll, in the final version in January 2022. Sounds right. So what I'm wondering is, when that happens, even if it's not January, would you like us to talk again, Charity? That'd be great. I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. That's it for this episode of Ship It. Thank you for tuning in. We have a bunch of podcasts for developers at Changelog that you should check out. Subscribe to the master feed at changelog.com forward slash master to get everything we ship. I want to personally invite you to join your fellow Changeloggers at changelog.com forward slash community. It's free to join and stay. Leaving, on the other hand, will cost you some happiness credits. Come hang with us in Slack. There are no imposters. Everyone is welcome. Huge thanks again to our partners, Fastly, LaunchDarkly, and Minode. Also, thanks to Breakmaster Cylinder for making all our awesome beats. That's it for this week. See you next week. Thank you.